<clears throat> so I was going to have the band come back up at the end, but uh, I don't think I'm going to be able to get through all my notes in enough time for you guys to do that. Uh, yesterday I spoke to a group on Zoom from different places in India and Bahamas and these different pastors and so forth. And uh, Michelle said, you have to keep it at 30 minutes. You can't go longer. So I had my notes and I read through them and everything and I got through them easily under 30 minutes. And, and then I began to, you know, preach it or teach it, whatever you think I am, a preacher or teacher. I actually don't even know. Uh, and after 30 minutes, my alarm went off. And after 31 minutes, Michelle, uh, you know, these texts are popping up on my computer. You got to finish. You got to finish. I'm thinking I have, I kept dropping all my pages on the ground. I kept looking. They kept, like, they were multiplying or something. I don't know what was happening. And uh, so anyways, uh, I have a good, good 35, 40 minutes uh, today. So hopefully we can get through. We're in a series called Seven. You've been enjoying the series? I, I have been enjoying it. Seven, hopefully it's been, uh, as a matter of fact, here's what I'd like you to do for me. Um, I'd like, if, if you want, only if you want, to text, to, to text me or write me an email, pastor at freedomlifectr.org, uh, how this series has, uh, what it's meant to you, if, if it's meant anything to you, uh, how it's changed you, how it's uh, challenged you, or how it's helped you in your understanding maybe of this this uh, strange book we call Revelation, this, this, this letter. Uh, and so if you wouldn't mind doing that, that would be great. I, that would be helpful for me as I, uh, next week as we come back and we kind of give a wrap up for the whole series. So I'd like to hear kind of, you know, from you, what it's, what it's, if it's done anything for you. If it hasn't, you know, I'll, I'll mention that too. <laughs> if you say it was boring and, or whatever, or too long-winded. Anyways, so it's this, it's in the book of Revelation, it's the last book in the New Testament, so it's easy to find. You go right to the end. Um, and it's Jesus uh, giving um, John how uh, in, a, in a vision or a dream somehow this message for him to write to these seven churches that are representative of these different areas in what we call, it's, that was Asia Minor, what is modern day Turkey. And so today we're in the seventh letter, we're done, right? This is it. And we're looking at the church in Laodicea. And today we're looking at a church that, um, actually I, I, I read in, a, in another book, I've been reading different books about, uh, about the seven churches, and I came across this one, it was all about Laodicea. And he entitled it in the book, uh, uh, Self-Satisfied Believers. Self-Satisfied Believers. Now, you might think, what in the world do I mean about self-satisfied believers. Well, there was a commercial, and this too I got from him, right? This, I didn't get this myself, but it was really interesting, so I thought I'd use it today. There was a commercial back, man, I don't even know how long ago it was. It was in uh, a Super Bowl commercial. How many like Super Bowl commercials? I mean, sometimes we watch the Super Bowl for the commercials. We talk during the game, and we're quiet during the commercial. We always go to Pete and Connie's house, and that's what we do, you know. We're, we're out getting food, stuff like that, and we go, commercials are on. We all rush back into the room to watch the commercials, you know. I don't know if you're the same way, but this was a Pepsi commercial, and it might give us some light into, uh, into this whole idea of self-satisfied believers. Let's watch that video, Amy, if you want to play that. I'm good. Be honest here, man. Oof! Ah, okay. I'm good. My bad. I'm good. I'm good. Ready? Go! <laughs> Men can take anything. I'm good. Except the taste of Diet Cola. <laughs> Until now. Pepsi Max, the first Diet Cola for men. Oh, listen, in case you haven't, uh, in case you didn't catch it, at the end of every one of those, uh, those mishaps, those accidents, uh, the guy said, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> hey, what is it about us that, uh, that after some, you know, something happens or whatever, we, we all have a tendency, no, 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 I'm good, I'm good, right? I don't know, I'm not sure if, if women necessarily do this or say this, I'm not sure, you can, you know, judge for yourself, you women, but guys, we're tend to, we tend to be like this, right? Something happens to us and, no, no, I'm good, I'm good. Uh, we, we, we somehow don't want to ask for help or, you know, someone, you know, we're, we're lost, you know, your wife says, ask for direction, no, no, I'm good, and then you wander around for another 
you know, how long? I don't know, half hour, an hour. No, no, I, I'm good. And so whenever someone offers to help us and they see we can use help, we say, no, I'm good. Now, here's the thing. This can happen to us uh, spiritually as well. Uh, hey, friend, I, I, you know, I see that you're, you know, maybe, maybe caught up in a, an addiction. Can I help you? No, no, I'm good. And by the way, stop judging me, right? No, no I, I'm good. And so the same thing we need to be careful of today. Who thinks we need to hear this today? Raise your hand. We, we need to hear this. Of all the letters, now, you may have been here for all seven of these letters. This is the seventh one. And at one time or another, you may have said, wow, this one, I really need to hear this one. And maybe you thought, well, that's good. It's good for me to remember, but not so much now. I think this one of all the letters is the most pertinent of all the letters for every single one of us today, today. Because we, we, we live in this, uh, in this, our culture, our society today, where we all seem to be so, uh, in, er in so many areas of our life, so self-sufficient, so I can take care of this myself, um, good. Uh, how many of you have been a follower of Christ, raise your hand, for longer than five years? Raise your hand. Okay. Then this is, this is absolutely, absolutely 100% for you. Older believers, maybe, may, older followers of Jesus may be thinking, you know, I, I, I don't need this right? Like, I don't need this, this message today, you know. I've heard it all. Uh, I've heard, you know, I've been in church for, a lot of us have been in church for over 30 years, 40 years. Isn't that true? And so you might be thinking, you know, what new, what new thing can I hear, right? Like, I, like, David is still beating Goliath, isn't he? Right? That's the story. I know the story. Someone tells you a story, and, and, and a lot of times we tune out. Like you'll hear, someone will say, we're going to talk about the story of the prodigal son. I'll automatically, I know that. Like I'm good. I'm good. And that's the trouble with us as older believers and younger believers. You know, they may, they may say, listen, I, I see the church, and like I see older believers, and they're so antiquated, and they're, you know, I'm, like I, I'm good. I don't need that. I'm good. I, could, I can go uh, worship God like out in the woods. It's true. I agree, right? The trouble with being out in the woods worshiping God is those trees aren't going to come and visit you in the hospital, are they? Or those trees aren't going to come through to you when you're in need. And so you could say, you know, I don't need the church. <clears throat> I'm good. And they say, stuck in their ways. The problem with this kind of attitude of, of I'm, I'm good is it, it kind of stifles our passion, um, it leads to, um, it leads to kind of arrogance, right? This self-sufficiency, and I think what it does is then it cuts, it cuts off any um, any future potential growth that we have. H here's a true statement: If you want to grow in your life, you have to be able to say, "I'm not good." I'm not good. If you want to grow, you have to know how to, you have to be able to say, I need help. Could, could you say that with me? Let's say it together. I need help. Why, why is that hard for us? I need help. Well, you know, Michelle and I, you know, pastoring now for 12 years, have seen so much stuff and people come to us and they and they get to the place where they need help and unfortunately a lot of times it's 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 never too late right it's never too late i think but but let's face it sometimes in our humanness it gets to the place where it's just it's just beyond beyond saving almost and we ask ourselves well, you know why six months ago didn't you come you know why i'm good I'm good. You can't say, I need help. Until it gets to the place where your world is kind of crashing in around you. And so when you're living this way, it stifles any, any growth that you're going to have. So here's what I want you to do today. Please, please just try to open your heart today. Open, your, open yourself up today.
to receive something. If it's one thing that's going to help you that you don't fall into the same, uh, the same place that the Laodicean church was. Let's, let's, let's look what it says in uh, 3.14. To the angel of the, or messenger, as we've learned, right? To the angel of the church at Laodicea, right? Now let's just pause right there like we've been doing. And let's take a look at, uh, now I've heard from some people say, I love the background stuff. Other people say they don't like the background stuff. But whether you like it or you don't like it, whether it's boring to you, it's so important to, to see and to understand what this, what this church, what this city was all about because, because Jesus uses the things that they know to, to speak to them, to talk to them, right? Things that are relevant to them. And they're not relevant to us, so we need to, we need to know what, what was going on there so we can go, okay, like, I get that. I get what he's saying to them. And then we can take, take that, right? We have context. Then we can take that context and we can now make an application to our life today, right? Otherwise, if you have no context, it's, it's almost impossible to get it right. And I've seen, especially in this text, I've seen so many people uh, get this text wrong. I've heard, I probably even, to be honest with you, I probably even, you know, taught or preached on this before, and in, in my opinion, I got it wrong. And so in the last, just really in the last 20 years, 2002, did archaeologists begin, only begin to uncover the city of Laodicea. Laodicea was up on a high, a real high plateau. Before 2002, show the picture, Amy, of the, of the grass. Before th- 2002, this is all that it was up on this plateau. That's all it was before 2002. Uh, because what happened was this city in, uh, in 60 AD, uh, well, let, let's, let, let's move forward. In 1200 AD or 1200 years ago, getting my numbers all scooped, 1200 years ago, this city was leveled uh, by an earthquake. Okay. Do you remember when we were talking about Philadelphia? And the earthquake in Philadelphia. Okay, we're going to get back to that earthquake in a minute. This was another earthquake 1,200 years ago uh, that leveled the city. And so the city at that time uh, was abandoned. And it's been covered up over 12, uh, since 1,200 years ago. Been covered up. The ruins been covered up with dirt. And so there's this one, arch- this one archaeologist that kept pestering the Turkish government. So he wanted to go in there and, 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 and uh, you know, uncover the ruins and everything. They kept saying no, kept pestering them, no, 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 no. And finally, in 2002, uh, they said yes. They allowed him to go in there and uncover these ruins. So what happened? When he started uncovering, he found that only under four feet of dirt, only four feet of dirt, he began to uh, discover the ruins of the city of Laodicea. Now, the, it, the ruins were laid flat. As you can imagine, an earthquake comes and it shakes everything and knocks everything down. So you, you can Google it. You can Google, you can see pictures of that time when everything is laid down. And then they call it a city reborn because uh, archaeologists began to, to reassemble it. So show the next picture. So they began to, all those things were laying down on the ground when, he, when they excavated, took the dirt off of it. Right? All were laying down. And they began to, to, to like, just pick them all back up. And reassemble it. And so, since 2002, now you're going to hear some things, and you're going to you're going to understand some things about about uh, about uh, <clears throat> Bible exegesis, Bible uh, hermeneutics, because we're learning things now, just in the last 20 years. That before, just 20 years. Are you, are you with me? 20 years, not long, not long at all. Especially if you're Marty's age. 20 years is like you blink your eye. 20 years goes by, right, Marty? <laughs> I'm already know. Yeah. And so in the last 20 years, we've discovered these things that before we didn't know, and, and they're shedding light on understanding Scripture, understanding it, just in 20 years. So you may think, oh, no, you know, I, I, I read the Bible and I could know. Listen, there are things that we're understanding. Well, you get the point. Let me, let me, let me just go on, okay? And so uh, this is a picture of the city reborn. For the first time, we, we're starting to understand uh, about the wealth of the city. So it's been, it's been in, in, in ancient writings and everything how wealthy the city of Laodicea was. Extremely, extremely wealthy uh, compared to, well, compared to all cities, but especially the other six cities. They, matter of fact, they've been discovering they had two uh, massive theaters 
uh, seating some, uh, I, I, they estimate 20, 25,000 people. They had a, a huge uh, stadium, a sports stadium that would be equivalent to uh, three modern football fields today. You remember us talking about different cities having an agora, like this shopping area, right? They had not one, not two, but five agoras in Laodicea. Now, we, we, we know from ancient passages, ancient text, uh, extra biblical text, how rich the city is. Now we're understanding why it is and how they got to be so rich. So let's talk about the city a little bit. The, the, its location of the city was perfect. Uh, like uh, another one of the cities, it was, uh, it was flat on this high plateau, but it was a junction, had two major, uh, major trade routes, two major trade routes that, that intersected at Laodicea. And so what they did in Laodicea is they capitalized on that fact. And one of the things they had at Laodicea, which is really interesting, they had uh, sheep that had black wool, black wool. And it was, no, it was this glossy, uh, um, uh, almost, like a, uh, almost like an oily black wool. And so Laodicea became this uh, textile center. And they were prized for this black wool, which they made raincoats out of. And so they're so prized for this. And so what happens is, is people are coming to the city, uh, you know, trade, uh, on this trade route and discovering this. And so the money starts to pour in because of this wool. And so they capitalized on it. So much so that it becomes one of the first banking centers. They literally minted their own uh, coins. Listen to this. Here, th this is what they did in Laodicea. In Laodicea, uh, People would have gold, and they would buy, buy and sell stuff with gold. So in Laodicea, listen, this is, this is incredible. Laodicea was the first place that they decided, you know what we're going to do? We're gonna, we'll have like a, a bank, and we'll hold your gold for you. Because it's so hard for you to go around carrying all that stuff. We'll hold it for you. And we'll give you certificates saying this is how much gold you have. And then when you come back in and with these certificates, and you will, what you'll do is you'll prove that who you are, and then you'll be able to get your gold back. And so you could take, it, like it was like the first checking account system in history. This is Laodicea. Isn't it fascinating? This is what's happening in uh, Laodicea. And it keeps getting better and better. Laodicea became um, a medical center. They came up with a, with a, uh, uh, with a salve. Uh, a lot of it made out of zinc. How did you know, Pete? I saw him rubbing his eye. It was an eye, for eye ointment for eye ointment, and it was made out of zinc, and so they were, they were well known for that. Okay, so look, that's a little bit of that background. So in 60 AD, we talked about that in Philadelphia, this earthquake that happened. So this earthquake happens, do you remember the, me talking about that in Laodicea? And Rome saying, coming along and helping them rebuild in, in, in Philadelphia. In Laodicea, imagine this now, in Laodicea, same earthquake, same thing happens, and, and uh, the Roman government, Caesar, comes and says, listen, don't worry, we're here, we're going to rescue you, and guess what they said in Laodicea? Can you guess? <laughs> we're good. We're good. We, we, we don't need any help. We don't need your help. We're good. And so this starts this uh, this self-sufficiency in Laodicea. Um, so listen, this a Roman senator, if you do any reading, Tacitus, T-A-C-I-T-U-S, Tacitus, was a, was a senator, and he's done, done, we have a lot of his writings. He wrote this, he's a, a Roman senator, he wrote, Laodicea rose from the ruin by the strength of their own resources and with no help from us and as they uncover, as they've been uncovering the ruins in Laodicea, listen to some of the inscriptions that they find on uh, buildings. Here's, uh, here's one, I don't know how to pronounce the name, uh, Nicostratus, uh, something like that. He said this, he said, I, Nicostratus, rebuilt the stadium out of my own resources. That's etched in the stone on the stadium. I rebuilt it with my own resources 
resources. Another one, I, Flaccus, restored the heated walkways at great personal expense. They had heated walkways. Heated walkways in Laodicea. They were proud of it. You could even see it on their money. So remember how I've been showing like coins and stuff like that? On their money, their motto was this, translated. It was this, Laodicea, the sacred and autonomous. So other ones had Caesars on them. Some had their own, their own business on there. For them, they said, Laodicea, the sacred and autonomous. Now, what's interesting is, decades later, uh, we're finding coins from decades later. I say we're, the archaeologists are finding coins from decades later. And, and after a, a number of decades, they dropped the sacred. They dropped it. And said, Laodicea, the autonomous. One thing that could be heard in Laodicea is a phrase like this, we don't need anything. We don't need anything. We, we have it all right here. We're good. Now, the thing about this, it wasn't just the city. It was also, it moved into the Christians in the city. And so what Jesus is saying to them is this. So now, you got the background, right? Now let's listen to what John is penning from this vision that he gets from Jesus. He says this. You say, um, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and I do not need a thing. What were they saying to God? <laughs> the, 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 the believers in Laodicea were saying the same thing to this, the, the emperor of the universe to what the Laodiceans were saying to their emperor. We're good. I'm good. I, I don't need anything. Like, I don't, I don't need your help. Like, I got it from here. We can take this. So, the Laodicean had a, a spiritual problem. And the spiritual problem is, if you're taking your notes in there, it's the delusion of spiritual self-sufficiency. The delusion of spiritual self-sufficiency. Now, what I want to tell us today, me included, is this is a danger for us Christians today. I asked you before how many have been Christians for over five years. Let me ask you something. Have you, have you, do you feel like that you've lost a little bit of your joy from, from when you first came to this understanding of God and his love for you? And Have you lost a little bit of your joy? Have you lost a little bit of your of your passion, maybe it's gone. Maybe you're just not feeling it anymore. Well, here's, here's how it goes. It goes like this. Step, step one is you, you, become, uh, you become awake. Awake to the sense of, of your need, of where you are in life, and, and awake to the, uh, to the revelation that there's a God, and he came to us in the person of Jesus Christ, and, and this, 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 this awakening, this, and that's, why, that's why the Bible calls it born again, right? It's this experience that makes you uh, uh, feel a new level of life and being alive, being born again. And then step two, what happens is, um, and a lot of times, uh, a lot of times that step comes from not always, comes from a difficulty, a hardship, right? And you're kind of, uh, you know, your life is, you know, not what you want it to be and there's got to be something more and you get this, and, 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 and that's not to say that it's always, you know, uh, you're on the streets. It can be you reach the top and you realize, hey, this ain't it. I'm still not fulfilled. I'm still not there. I'm still not. There's got to be something more than this. I thought this would fulfill me. I thought living, living in that neighborhood, uh, having this much money, driving this kind of car, whatever it is, right? M meeting this person, marrying this person, having this many, whatever it is. And you realize, man, it didn't, that didn't do it. So whatever that aha moment is, and then what happens is, is your life starts to, your inner life, mind you, like it's not always your outer life, but your inner life starts to get better. And you start to realize that, wow, well, I'm, I'm saved by grace. The trouble is that 
after time, we, we forget to continue to live by grace. And we start to live uh, because it, it, in, in the beginning, it's like, God, I, I need you. Like, I need you. Because all this stuff, like, like it says in Ecclesiastes, all this stuff is meaningless. But with you, it all, it all gains meaning. And then what happens is, is we begin to live life for a while. We begin to kind of just lose that. We begin to think, you know, I used to always say, uh, you know, when I was raising support as being a missionary, uh, I would, we would get, Michelle and I would go out and talk to churches, and they would, uh, they would give uh, us support to live overseas. And I used to think, wow, man, this is really dependent on God. You know what I mean? And, and it, was a, it was a fallacy of mine that before I was a carpenter, and I thought, uh, what, what provided my income was my hammer, right? And, and I had this fallacy that I was actually doing that. And then through this whole process of being a missionary, I realized, wow, it's only God that gives me the, the talent, the ability, the strength, the knowledge, the skill to be able to do that anyway. It all comes from him. Whether or not churches are supporting me or a, a job is whatever, it all comes from him. But what happens is over time, you begin to get complacent. You begin to think, you know what? Like, I got this, God. I'm, I'm, I'm back on my feet again. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm together. And we begin to um, uh, forget to pray, right? Pray for God's uh, uh, guidance in our life. And because why? Because um, I'm good. I'm good. And we rely on our own strength rather than God's strength working through us. This is what's happening to the church in Laodicea. It's been happening to the church in America for a long time. Now, what's interesting to me is, is that in, these, in all these letters, Jesus' solution to the church there is not get out of Dodge. See, Dodge is the problem. Everybody look at me for a minute. I want you to know something. Dodge is never the problem. Dodge is never the problem. Because you move from Dodge and you move somewhere else, get, guess who you took with you? You. You. And so Laodicea is not really the problem. America is not really the problem. The problem is internal. And so Jesus deals uh, with that. So how can, how can Christians, I'm talking to us, how can Christians in a comfortable situation avoid the trap of, or the illusion of spiritual sufficiency. Let's talk about curing this, uh, this, this problem of self-sufficiency. The first thing is this, let's look at, let's understand the symptoms, the symptoms of spiritual self-sufficiency. Jesus says this, I know your deeds. In other words, I, I, know, I know the life you live, I get it, I know that, I understand that. I'm not, I'm not without understanding of, of where you live and what it's like there, I know your deeds. And then he says this, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one, you're either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. I can't tell you how many messages I've heard about this. And, and I look at it now in light of everything that I've learned, and I think, wow, we just miss it so much. And we've built whole theologies around text that isn't, it's not, it's just not right. This isn't, number one, let me just say this, number one, first off. This isn't about the church in Laodicea losing their salvation. That's not what this is about. This spitting out of the mouth is not them, not God rejecting them, right? God's love is, God's love is never turned away. It's not about, not about God rejecting them. This is a, this is kind of a, I don't know, I'll say like a colorful way of, uh, of Jesus saying, uh, okay, imagine this. Imagine our church being, uh, being written up in the Bible. Your church is in the Bible? Yeah, that's the good news. The bad news is, is saying our church makes him sick. <laughs> like that's the, that's the bad. Good news is we're in the Bible. The bad news is our church makes Jesus sick. That's kind of what he's saying. He's saying like, you know, just kind of like, like the way you're living is not, is not, is not what I have for you, Right? Remember John 10, 10, Jesus said, I've come that you might have life in its most abundant form. And they, they weren't living that way. And he said, it kind of makes me sick to see the way the church is living. 
Now, here's the thing about Laodicea. I saved one bit of information for you. For all of its riches, it lacked one extremely important resource. Can anybody guess what it is? Water. It lacked water. Now, there are two cities, one right across the valley, one, uh, the furthest one about six miles away. Um, one is called Heropolis. If you want to write that down, you want to look up yourself. H-I-E-R-A-P-O-L-I-S, Heropolis. And you could look it up. It had amazing hot springs. Uh, Amy, show that. Do I have a picture up there of the hot springs? No, that's not it. Uh, go, go, see if you can find it. It's back in Dropbox. Pull it up because I want them to see that. Take that picture off there. We'll get that, that in a minute. If you could just p- pick that up, Amy, that'd be great. So they had these hot springs, and the hot springs are there today. Well, if she can find it, we'll see the picture of it. You can go there today and soak in these hot springs that the water is a constant 95 degrees, 95 degrees. I hope to go to a friend's house one day, get invited to go to sit in their hot tub. I haven't been invited yet. I won't say their name or anything. They might, they might even be here today. I don't know. Um, <laughs> that's sort of a little inside joke. And so Heropolis had these hot springs. Uh, did you find a picture of that, Amy? Okay, that's okay. Well, I'm going to move on. So that's, there they are right there. Isn't that amazing? Hey, listen, hey, listen to this. From, uh, from Laodicea, you can see across the valley, and you can see for a mile, see all that white, that sediment from the minerals? You could see, it must, have been, it must have irked them so much in Laodicea. Look right across and see this unbelievable hot tubs. You know what I mean? All the white across there, just beautiful. And they, and they got nothing. They got nothing. And then there's a, 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 another neighbor um, uh, in the other direction uh, from Laodicea that had, uh, that had uh, cold water. And so this city had this, this uh, it was uh, melted snow, right? And it was constant. It was year long, this melted snow. This, so can you imagine melted snow? How cold is that? Michelle talked about the Grand Canyon. I was in the, I was in the Grand Canyon. I was in the, is it the Snake River? What's in Grand Canyon? What, what is it? What is it? Man, you all talk at the same time. I can't hear anything. Okay, Colorado River. I went in there. That water is ice cold. Ice cold. And listen, it was like, I was driving through, it was, it was like over 100 degrees, right, when I was there. And that water is coming out from, you know, out from the Rockies. And that, it is so, so cold. Imagine that in this city. They have this ice cold water. And in Laodicea, they have neither, neither. So here's what they do. They're pretty smart in Laodicea, and they got a lot of money. So they engineered a system of pipes of aqueducts to bring the water in from six miles away. Show those pipes again. There's, the, there's some of the pipes right there they're uncovering right now. Now, if you could see in this pipe, uh, the pipe keeps getting smaller and smaller. It's kind of like our arteries if we get older, if we don't take care of ourselves. They keep getting smaller and smaller. Sediment, right? Cholesterol build up in there. Same with these pipes. And, uh, the, but the problem was this. The problem was, by the time the hot water got there, guess what it was? Guess what it was? Lukewarm. By the time the cold water got there, guess what it was? Lukewarm. So when when Jesus says, I'd rather you be hot or cold, is he saying, I want you to be on fire for me or I want you to be against me? Is that what he's saying? That's not what he's saying. He's not saying that at all. I'd rather have you be, uh, or, or if you're lukewarm, right? So he's saying this lukewarm. Now, now that's, that's a sense where it is a little bit of a crossover. But this isn't about he's for people who are against him or he wants people to be super on fire for him. What he's saying is uh, hot water is useful, isn't it? Like for healing. Like sitting in those, the, those uh, mineral-rich hot tubs. Like the healing properties in that. Cold water refreshes you. So what he's saying is cold water and hot water, like they're, 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 they're valuable, they're useful. Lukewarm water, especially this water that's been brought from all this distance and picking up from all the, all the minerals and picking up all the sediment and all that, when you go to drink something like that, 
The other day I got in my, in my uh, Jeep and I reached down. And I wasn't really paying attention. I'm driving. I reached down and I grabbed my Starbucks cup and I drank it. And I was like, oh, that was from yesterday. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was my coffee from yesterday. It wasn't hot like it was supposed to be. Or you might get maybe you like, like the, the ice cappuccinos or something. I don't know. Right? The next day, like they're no good. Like, like Starbucks isn't, say, isn't selling uh, tepidchinos, right? They're not selling those. Right? They're selling hot. I, I get mine extra hot. Like no one likes this, 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 this room temperature, this tepid, this lukewarmness. And so he says, here, I'll spew you out of my mouth, right? Well, that, that's this idea that if they drank that water full of all these minerals and sediment, it would upset their stomach. Do you see how Jesus is using what they know to talk about their spiritual condition, their life? And so, um, l- listen to this. There's, this. there's this block. Show this. This is really amazing. Show that big block. You have a picture of a big, big block up there, Amy? Well, if you find that too, I, I think I, there were some other pictures I had I forgot to tell Amy about, but uh, there, they, they uncovered this big, huge block with an inscription on it. This is how serious they took their water. It was the Laodicean water law. Okay, they uncovered This is no joke. This is no joke. They, they translate it. This is what it says. The use of water is managed by law. The water abusers will incur a severe penalty ranging from 5,000 to 12,500 denarii. That's how serious their water problem was. Now look at this. It said this. (laughs) This cracks me up. It said, and those who report water abusers receive one-eighth the penalty of the reward. So they're encouraging people to rat out their, their fellow neighbors, right? And for all their strength in Laodicea, water was their weak spot. And so Jesus zeroes in on this situation and uses it as an analogy for their spiritual life. He's saying your spiritual life is kind of like, it's kind of like this, this water. Hot and cold water is good for something. They were, if you're taking notes, you can write this in. They were... Uh, they were so passionless that they were purposeless. So passionless they were purposeless. So I, I mentioned it before, but lukewarm can also be referred to, and we often refer to it as uh, room temperature. Huh, Pete? You like to drink room temperature water. Um, and what does that mean? That means that the, everybody, uh, stop for a minute, look at me for a minute. This, this is, I think this is important. This is Room temperature water is the same temperature as what? Everything else around it. Do you, do you follow? Do you follow what he's getting at to the, to the Christians? He's saying this. He's saying, listen, you guys, you guys are the same as everybody around you. You, 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 uh, you have the same, uh, same morality, maybe, as everybody around you. Uh, the same thoughts as everybody around you. The same media consumption as everybody around you. Maybe you don't like that one. Right? You're the same as everybody else in the room. Now remember, remember this, lest, lest we forget. Jesus is writing to these churches because he loves them. Isn't that true? He's writing because he loves them. Same way he loves us. And here, here's what else he knows. He knows that the church in that time, church in first century, we know from history, he knew from knowing all things, that they were going to face, they're going to be facing some, some 250 years of persecution. This is persecution going on in our world today. You know, if, I'm, I'm no prophet, but I just look at the handwriting on the wall I don't think it's far off that we're going to be facing it in, in America, right? It's already, it's already kind of there. It's already kind of started. You know what I mean? I mean even years ago, uh, taking, taking prayer out of schools and removing Ten Commandments, like, uh, all this stuff to remove anything that has to do with, with Christianity. It's already started. There might become a time when it'll be illegal to meet here and do this. Wouldn't that be terrible? 
But it might, it might be coming to that. And so what Jesus is saying is, is, he's trying to help them and saying, listen, if you're going to, and, and it's for us, right? If you're going to survive in difficult times, you're going you're gonna to have to have, you're going to have to have your passion. You're going to have to live for a purpose. This lukewarmness, it may cut it in your life right now. It may cut it. You may be okay. You may be able to skirt by. What's important to remember is this letter is not written to, and we'll talk about it here in a minute, is not written to those who have not come to understand who Jesus is and not, they're not believers in Christ. It's not written to them. This is written to believers, followers of Jesus. That's who it's written to. So it's written to us. So Jesus is saying to them, and he's saying to us, the biggest danger of our survival in difficult times is lukewarmness. Is this idea that, I, like, I got this. I really don't need any help. I can, I can, I, I don't have to come to, I don't have to go to church. I can stay home. I read my Bible myself. And I, what do they say? Um, I'm good. I'm good. Well, the church really helped me get back on my feet, and I'm so glad I am, but I'm good now. I got it from here. I'm good. So, if that is the symptom, we already talked about this, the disease. The disease is, Revelation 3, 16 and 17, you say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and don't need anything. And it's, it's pride. It's pride. It's spiritual pride. And he says, but you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Sometimes we get to be, we can be blind to what is. Okay, let, let, let's move on. I'm out of time here, but let's talk about real quick. Let's talk about the prescription then. It says, uh, the prescription. Think about this for a minute. Um, uh, f if first responders come on the scene, if somebody uh, fell into a lake or something like that and they have hypothermia, what's the first thing they do? They try to raise their body temperature, their core temperature. So, so in, in this state of lukewarmness, how does Jesus talk to us about raising our, uh, raising our uh, core uh, spiritual temperature? And I love this because this is a very rich city, isn't it? Now he goes to a, 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 a money kind of metaphor and he talks about this. He says, I counsel you to buy from me, right? Right, talking about financial metaphor. Come to me as your financial advisor, your financial planner. And invest in, uh, invest in, he says this, gold refined in fire so you can become rich. Well, didn't they already have gold? Yes, they already have gold. What's Jesus alluding to here? Jesus is alluding to what we find in the gospel. He says, store up for yourself what? Treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and thieves cannot come in and steal. So how do I do that? How do I, how do, I do that? Number one is, the first bullet point is live with purpose. Live with purpose. This is a way to, to raise your spiritual temper, temperature. You remember, uh, oh, Christmas time, I showed a video. video. Connie, come on up. I showed a video. Come on up, bring your things, yeah. Uh, I showed a video of... Uh, of that guy in Kansas City, Missouri, where the real rich guy, he would hand out $100 bills to people. I told you I'm not gonna have time for music, Michelle. I know, I know I'm over. If you have to leave, go ahead and leave. Doors aren't locked back there. Okay, we don't lock the doors. You're free to go. Uh, but I, I gotta finish this. So uh, he, he would go out, he would take his resources, rich, very rich guy, and every Christmas, he would hand out uh, $100,000 in $100 bills. And so one year, I didn't show the whole video, one year he went to the, all, to the police because police were getting kind of a, a bad, you know, bad rap for be, just being police. And he wanted to help bolster them too. So what he did is he gave them the $100. They would go out and stop people. And they had to stop people for uh, driving, while, driving while having a rusted car. Right? You need help. Get him $100. And what he's saying is this purpose, living with purpose, using your resources, using your talents, using your abilities for a purpose, what it does. You watch a, you watch a, a, a video like that, you can't help but be warmed inside. Right? It kind of makes you want to go out and do it yourself. I want to do that too. And so 
And so using your talents and abilities and your resources to help others. So we do that here in different ways. I want Connie to talk about that here uh, if you can. Grab a, grab a mic there. I don't know if that mic's going to be on or not. Amy, can you unmute the keys mic? Thank you. There you go. Perfect. So, yeah, this is Caring Crafters. Come up here. I don't think this is going to reach. I stand. So, yeah, I'll just. We're really there. prepared <laughs> today. Uh, <laughs> so, this is Caring Crafters. We have a ministry here at, at Freedom Life Center. And it's called Karen Crafters. We meet our chapter here at Freedom Life Center. It's actually a national ministry, but our cha Freedom Life Center chapter is amazing. We meet the last Tuesday of every month from 7 to 9. Talk about using your gifts for God. This started 14 years ago when an older woman came to me and said, I don't know if God's done with me. And I remember telling her, your eyes are open. So he's obviously not done with you. When he's done, he'll take you home. And I said, what can you do? And she says, I can knit. I said, God can use that. And that's how Karen Crafters started. It used to be called Crochet and Pray years ago, but has morphed into Karen Crafters now. And um, so we get together. These are some workmanship from Tina, and there's a couple one in here from Blake, made a little dock, and this is from Linda, this little rabbit. And people are thinking, well, what is all that about? We have made so many amazing things. Stephanie's one of my powerhouses, and Carol. There, I don't want to start naming because I'm going to forget somebody. Gigi. You already did start I know, dang it. But anyway, <laughs> look how cute these are. But listen, these are going. We've done things like cancer caps, where we take them to Hillman Center for women who've lost their hair. We do prayer shawls for the Abundant Life Ministry Center for women who've been raped. These stuffed animals are going tomorrow to Ruby Hospital in West Virginia down in Morgantown. And what these are for, it's for Lissy's Love is a ministry that gives gifts to families who have ultra preemie babies that are born ounces old. I had showed pictures to the group. Um, this need came to us two weeks ago and we've been scrambling in two weeks to try to meet the deadline, which is tomorrow, um, where they will deliver these to the hospital to be given to the siblings of those little wee ones that are clinging to life. The mom and dad are so consumed with the care for that child that they're living in the NICU. Yet there's these brothers and sisters and little ones too that are scared and they don't know why they're there and they're not sure what's happening and what's wrong with my baby brother or baby sister. And so these are gonna be gifts that are gonna be given to give a little comfort and love. We have 17, I think I see Stephanie with one, so 18, so all I know is Linda said it, don't look at me because I'll cry, but she said it to me this morning, she goes, you know, it's so cool to think about Con, God already knows those 18 kids when we were knitting and crocheting, sitting on our couches or on our back porch or wherever we do to do that. So that's a skill, is it life changing? No, but it's a gift and it's simple. And usually that's the best stuff, is the mm -hmm. simple stuff, and using it to extend a loving hand of God. Great. So thank Thanks, you. Connie. Thank you. So we use our talents and our abilities uh, for a purpose, for a purpose. And when we do this, what it does, it, hel it helps raise our core spiritual temperature. Do you feel yourself getting lukewarm? And begin to use your talents for a purpose. And then he says this, and the white and and white clothes to wear, so that you can uh, cover your shameful nakedness. White. I'm just gonna. I, I have so much I could talk about about these these next couple things, but let me just say I'm not gonna do it. White represents holiness, sort of a, a, a purity of living uh, righteously. Begin to live. Just begin to live above the, 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 the this, you know, it's kind of like this, this, uh, this low hum of this is just the way life is, right? Begin to set a different standard just for yourself, not for, not for everybody right, for yourself. To live a little bit more, a little bit more like Jesus. And what this does is it raises that, that core spiritual temperature. And then he goes, then he goes to this, this idea of, of, uh, remember they had, I told you they had this medical center and they developed this salve for eyes. Listen, he says this, and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Isn't that amazing? What's he referring to? Well, what, what, if you see things the way they are, what's he talking about? He's talking about wisdom, about living in wisdom. Ask God for wisdom 
Revelation 3.19, it says this, those of whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. That's, but that's a good thing. That's a good thing. So be earnest and repent. I mean, repent, remember we talked about that? About changing the way that you think? All, and all, so where, okay, where do we get these? All three are found in one place, one refreshing place. Revelation 3.20, here I am. Here I am, Jesus says. I stand at the door and knock. Put the, do I have the picture up there? Uh, William Holman Hunt's picture of Jesus standing at the door. Did you have that one too, uh, Amy? Maybe not. You can look up yourself. William, William Holman Hunt did a picture of Jesus standing at the door. It's interesting, all the stuff he uh, incorporated into it. But he says, uh, I stand at the door and knock. If anybody hears my voice and opens the door. Now remember, this, this text was used so much for people talking about uh, like unbelievers. Who's this written to? Followers of Jesus. Believers. And see, see he's telling us today, listen, I stand at the door and knock. Uh, it's, it's, it's interesting in the picture. It's, well, that's uh, not very good. That's okay. Uh, in this picture, his depiction of it, um, the doorknob is on the inside, no doorknob on the outside. Isn't that cool? I stand at the door and knock. If anybody hears and they open the door, Jesus isn't going to barge into your life. He doesn't do that. Doesn't barge into your life. He doesn't come in and start trying to make all kind of changes and everything. He said, listen, I stand at the door and knock. If anybody hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in. I'll come in and eat with you. I'll be with you. I love that. I love that, uh, that terminology. I'll come in and eat with you. Isn't that great? Because what is, uh, what is it about we sit down together and, and we have dinner together? That's why we do meal groups. Sit down together, have dinner together. And man, it just seems like everything just kind of opens up. And you're there and you're sharing a meal together. You're breaking bread together. And it's just an awesome time. And he says that. Come in and eat with you and you with me. The bottom line is Jesus is saying this to us. Welcome me in to your daily life. Welcome me in to your daily life. Every single day, welcome me in. Listen, if I'm honest with you, days go by where I don't, I don't think about my relationship with, with God. Days go by. Until you know when? Until I start thinking about the message for Sunday. And I start, oh yeah, I forgot, you know. Have you, have you ever been that way? Have you been that way you go for days? Maybe weeks? maybe months. It's not that you lost your salvation. It's the same thing Jesus is saying. You just, you just become lukewarm. Lukewarm. And so he gives us this idea of how to get our passion back. How to get that back. And when you get that back, when you start to live that way, right, and difficult times comes, you're able to stand. You're able to stand. Okay, I know I went way over time. Thanks for uh, bearing with me. I hope, I hope that something today, you know, spoke to your heart, challenged you, something for you, for you to, uh, you know, tuck away somewhere and for you to start thinking, you know what? Uh, I've become lukewarm. I've become lukewarm. And I want, I, want to get, I want to get that passion back. So I want to pray for you. You want to stand with me? Father, we thank you again for your word. It's so rich. It just talks so much about your love for us and, and our life and how you desire us to live, to live in harmony with you, with one another, to live in love and peace and, 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 and live with passion and purpose, God. Help us to, help us to regain what we've lost if we've, if we've come to a place where we're maybe complacent. We feel like, ah, and I got this Christianity thing. I got it kind of nailed down and kind of just cruising along. Help us to take it out of cruise control and begin to, again, live with a passion for life, a passion for you, and a passion for others. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, friends. Have a great day.